I would like to take this opportunity now to bring to the stage uh, General John Allen, President John Allen, and Bruce Jones. And I'll do very brief introductions. Um, John Allen is, of course, the president of the Brookings Institution. He is also a retired four-star Marine Corps general who most recently served as commander of NATO International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. And he also served as a special presidential envoy to the Global Coalition to defeat the Islamic State. We have Bruce Jones, who is, of course, no stranger to you at this point, director of the Foreign Policy Program, but also is someone who has advanced the conversation on challenges to democratic states and institutions, who also has a significant amount of experience in multilateral institutions, crisis management, um, and intervention. I'd also take this opportunity to introduce Adam Schiff, who will be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff currently represents California's 28th district in um, been in Congress since 2001. He is also chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence um, and is the, speaking about issues related to democratic institutions, co-founder of the Congressional Caucus for Freedom of the Press, which aims to advance uh, press freedom press freedom worldwide. And importantly for this conversation tonight, he is a leading example of civility amidst turmoil, as well as a leading voice on critical questions facing the U.S. and democracy worldwide. So we look forward to joining him in a few minutes. And in the interim, I will start a conversation with you. So what I'd like to do in this conversation is take a lot of what we've discussed today analytically, strategically, talking about challenges to democratic states and institutions globally. We had a panel with Salam Fayyad on democracy in the Middle East. We've had a panel looking at a liberal trends within Europe. And what I think would be great to have a conversation on now is advancing the conversation from strategic analysis into tactical and also strategic action moving forward. Uh, both of you were at the Munich Security Conference this year where rifts in the transatlantic alliance were in full display at a time where, as we've discussed today, there are new and resurgent challenges from authoritarian states. So I'd like to get a sense from each of you on what aspect of the agenda in dealing with China in particular can the transatlantic community advance at this time? And we'll start with you, General Allen. Well, I think the Chinese uh, challenge, first, um, Tori, let me just make, I, I'm sorry, I want to thank you for your great work on this, uh, this effort. Uh, I know this is the, the work of a lot of scholars uh, at Brookings, uh, but I know that you had a very important role in pulling this together, and I'm very grateful for that. And the audience tonight is just full of dear friends, uh, colleagues, folks that I've had the opportunity to admire, both from a distance and up close. And uh, we're very grateful you could join us this evening. And, of course, I have to acknowledge that Strobe Talbot is in the audience as well. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Strobe. Um, the, the Chinese challenge, I think, is the challenge of our era. I don't wake up every morning believing that we're going to end up at war with the Chinese. I, I don't believe that. Uh, but I do believe that the, the Chinese, in pursuit of their interests, are going to take those steps that are necessary in order to secure those interests uh, and I do believe that as they do that, uh, they'll seek to neutralize the competition as they go along. Uh, Bruce referred earlier today to the 19th Party Congress, uh, which is really, I think, history uh, historians will look back on that, uh, that event as perhaps one of the seminal moments for the future of China in, in a very big way. Uh, we have seen the consolidation of power uh, in, the, in the person of Xi Jinping over the last uh, several years. Uh, they now call him the chairman of everything. Uh, that's not by accident. Uh, what we have seen with uh, President Xi's being enshrined, literally enshrined, in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, along with Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, which is not an insignificant uh, gesture, is that his sense of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, his capacity to centralize authority and power, his, uh, the stabilization and the, the removal of term limits for him, the capacity for them to think at a strategic depth far beyond typically that which Western states or other states can, and then to plan and then to resource gives them a capacity that we, we must uh, pay attention to very, very closely. Uh, um, realization of that is the Belt and Road Initiative, 
their very aggressive activities in the developing world, their development uh, of uh, 5G technology, uh, their wind sprinting uh, into the world of artificial intelligence, uh, their enormous strides in biotechnology and supercomputing. This is a peer competitor in many respects to the United States. Uh, and I, I have said to our colleagues overseas <clears throat> that this, this is no longer an environment where this is about the United States and China. Uh, I think sometimes this administration seeks to pursue policies of containment. We haven't the capacity to contain China. We have the capacity as a member of a community of nations where we are a partner or a leader, not a hegemon, but a leader in the community of nations. We have the capacity to compete with China. But I don't believe that we any longer have the capacity short of a major military conflagration that to me is a failure on everyone's part uh, to contain China. So for us, Bruce's uh, this study and Bruce's points are very important. It, it's not about the West any longer. In fact, I truly believe, having been an East Asia guy for most of my career, it's never been about the West. And sometimes our chauvinism uh, and our confidence in ourselves has overshadowed the enormous uh, progress that has been made in democracy and, and economic progress within East Asia. And those states are poised to accept a global community, I believe, that adheres to mutually agreeable values. We don't have to agree necessarily on the democratic principles, but I think we can agree on similar values and the strength and the synergy that comes from that community can, I believe, be what can compete with the Chinese. And Bruce, to bring you into the conversation here, I mean, we did see a speech from uh, Vice President Pence in which it was expected that he would make the case for greater competition with China to bring Europeans into the fold in this type of competition, and he didn't. Uh, and at the same time, we heard earlier from Marietta Shaka that the United States' approach thus far to the Europeans has been one of kind of do or die, take these you know, work with us on trade, work with us on China, or tariffs are coming your way. I mean, clearly this is not the way to deal with and build alliances at a time of, of greater competition from powers like China. So how should the United States be approaching and moving forward this agenda with European allies? With your collective permission, I'm not going to take Vice President Pence's speech as a starting point for strategic thinking about this <laughs> question. Um, uh, no comment beyond that on that one. Look, I think there's a genuine debate to be had here. There's no question that Europe will be an important part of a global question of how we respond to China on technology, on infrastructure, a whole series of issues that relate. Um, and the notion that Tom Wright here and many others here have talked about and Marietta echoed today of a kind of joint European-American strategy on China is valid. That being said, um, it seems to me that there's a, a serious debate to be had about the relative balance uh, in our strategy vis-a-vis -vis Europe, about how much effort we want to see Europe putting on the China question on the one hand versus the very acute question right now of Russia. Uh, we're going to end up having to do with both, but it seems to me pretty clear over time that China will be by far and away the larger challenge for us and we will be absorbed by Asia. I'm skeptical of the notion which gets around in the debate that we have to have a kind of uh, a balance of um, uh, sort of looking for here a, um, a burden sharing with Europe in terms of dealing with China in Asia. I'm skeptical about that. I'm not so sure how much Europe adds to the table in that. And there's a lot to do in Europe's own immediate vicinity, even if Europe were in sort of full health, which it's not. So my own sense is that in the, in the, in the very short term, we need to be kind of synced up on all of these issues. But over time, we probably want to, we'll probably end up with the United States really carrying a much larger share of the load in, in Asia uh, with the Asian allies. And we should ideally be looking to Europe to be doing more on Russia. How viable it is, okay, that's, then we have to read Constanza's papers about whether or not Germany will come back to its voluntarist moment and, and be depressed. Um, but uh, if Europe can sort of recover from the moment it's, it's in, then that kind of emerging division of labor would make sense to me. It's up to you, Constanza. So, uh, John, you brought up this point about digital authoritarianism earlier, how the challenge from Russia and China will become increasingly more difficult as capabilities in artificial intelligence grow stronger. And I want to ask you a little bit further on this. How do you view the challenge of digital authoritarianism from Russia and China? And specifically, 
how can the United States and its allies defend itself when these technologies that China is honing internally on censorship and monetization become exported, perhaps even within the West? Well, let me, let me come to the latter of your points first. I think we're going to face a moment, uh, particularly with the perhaps the catalytic ingredient in this being the deployment of 5G technology. We're going to find ourselves at a moment where the Chinese, uh, both in the sheer magnitude of what they can bring to bear in 5G, the networks associated with that, plus the associated technologies that will now be not just enabled, but accelerated in many respects as a result of 5G technology. Um, one of the things that the Chinese have done, I think, masterfully uh, is, and my European friends tell me this, is that they have made it, this is the term they use, they have made it convenient to deal with China. It's very difficult to deal with other Western companies, and in, the, in particular in the developing world where the Chinese truly are, I think, outstripping us in a very substantial way, uh, we will see in the not-too-distant future that a Chinese development package uh, will not just include some form of, of financial arrangement. There will also be a technological arrangement to it. And I'm, I'm, I will tell you, we are going to play hell trying to unravel Chinese 5G technology in the developing world. First, it will empower the instincts of many of the strong men, uh, and they're men, uh, they will, it will empower many of the instincts of the strong men with whom the Chinese will seek to create relations in the developing world. <clears throat> it will give them a capacity to extend surveillance cultures in those countries that will begin to reflect in very real ways the surveillance culture that is emerging in China. Um, and that's just in the developing world where there are really very few rules necessary for, the, for a country to participate with a Chinese development package. For us, we're far more fragmented. The rest of the world is far more fragmented in the kind of uh, development assistance we can bring, and the scope and the magnitude is less. But the rules, I think properly, the rules that we seek to imbue in the process make it much more difficult for undeveloped democracies or undeveloped systems of government to embrace what we, what we uh, represent. So the Chinese are convenient. Uh, with respect to technology, uh, I think we're facing uh, a very real probability, and I think that there are issues associated with semiconductors where we still possess much of the market. <clears throat> but as we attempted to limit Chinese capacity for supercomputing development, they went off on their own. And they have developed a very credible, very capable capacity for supercomputing. And they're well down the road on quantum computing as well. Uh, so that type of technology, and as we know, artificial intelligence is a function of really three things. Uh, access to big data. And the Chinese, of course, have big data that you can't begin to imagine. Uh, access to speed of computing or supercomputing. And then finally, functional algorithms that give you the capacity then once the big data is crunched through the supercomputer, uh, the capacity to make decisions or to render uh, outcomes that speed the capacity for governance or for societal control. So we're seeing that in, in China in ways, and to a lesser extent in Russia, uh, we're seeing that in China in ways that are truly alarming. Now, in our own case, China isn't competing against the United States. We're just not on the field. What China is doing is it's competing with our digital giants. And each of those, this is not a criticism because it's the reality of the world we live in, each of those are pursuing their own interests uh, economically. Some of them are dealing with China. Some of them have refused to deal with China. I think increasingly they have become self-aware about their corporate social responsibilities with respect to the outcomes of the technologies that they are developing. Uh, and either they are abetting the capacity of China to consolidate its own technological capabilities and to further exacerbate Chinese surveillance in the third world, or, and this is the reality, we use the term here at Brookings, digital governance, the competition of the digital giants in, the ter in, in terms of 
uh, social media platforms, the competition of those entities with traditional Westphalian forms of government has, in fact, the pernicious effect of breaking down the cohesion and the coherence of Western or developed democracies at the time, same time that it strengthens the capacities in, the, in China and authoritarian states. Because, as we know, the difference, I'm sorry to go on so long, the difference between the private sector, the public sector, and the party in those kinds of states where uh, mechanisms of control and the private sector, those lines are very blurred. And in fact, China can channel the capacity of what we would identify as the public sector or the private sector to the ends of the party itself. So for us, you know, we have Washington, which is largely, we've had a couple of of, uh, AI EOs come out in the last 10 days or so. But the entire investment of the United States in the development of uh, artificial intelligence can be measured at, at less than $10 billion in our recent past. Xi Jinping committed in his first year uh, after the 19th Party Congress $150 billion and the full intent benchmarked to surpass the United States technologically by 2030. Now, I had the chance at Davos to meet with uh, Wang Shishan, the vice president of China. I met with him for a couple of reasons, but one in particular was to talk about uh, the Chinese presence at Davos, and, and I listened carefully to his speech before I met with him one-on-one. And in his speech, he talked about a couple of things, and we need to be attentive to this. He said four times in his speech that China... First, first let me back up. He, first, he embraced the thesis of Davos, which is globalization 2.0, and embracing the technological realities of the fourth industrial revolution. We're all, he said, we, China, are all about that. And he said, we're going to pursue our ends in that regard through socialism with Chinese characteristics. But then he said something to me personally, which really chilled me. He said, China will oppose, and China will never tolerate technological, he called it techno-hegemony. So they're, they're on the field. They're playing hard. They got a date, 2030. They have $150 billion. They have a constancy of leadership, a deep vision for their strategy, and the capacity ultimately for coherence that we don't have. And we better wake up to this because our governments are not on the playing field. And there are people around the world in emerging democracies or even in developed democracies who find they have more loyalty to the digital platform to which they subscribe, what we would call digital citizens, than they would be the natural citizens of the Westphalian government, two ridge lines over, that's doing nothing for them. So when Mark Zuckerberg shows up on the Hill to testify before the Senate, someone who has, in essence, some semblance of loyalty of two billion people, and when you watch the Senate questioning him, and they didn't lay a glove on him, it was, it was this, very deep separation in his capacity to explain himself and their capacity to understand. What you saw was the emergence of digital governance in direct competition with the legacy of Westphalian governance. This should alarm us. This should alarm us. And so the question we should ask ourselves is, did Mark Zuckerberg appear as the CEO of a digital giant, or did Mike Zuck- Mark Zuckerberg appear as the head of state of a digital entity, a digital country? Uh, those are the questions we should be thinking about now. Bruce, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this aspect of digital authoritarianism, but to, to add another aspect of this challenge, staying on the geopolitical level, another conversation we've been having today that I think can be pushed further is whether we are seeing a greater, more unified challenge from Russia and China together. And it's interesting, John, your remarks touch on this notion of digital authoritarianism being able to make inroads into democratic societies. However, I also see that there is a sense of perhaps nascent authoritarian learning between governments in how leaders maintain control of their citizens within authoritarian societies, within new, new sorts of technology at their fingertips. So, Bruce, in addition to this authoritarian learning, do you think that Russia and China will present a more unified front, a more unified challenge to the West in the years ahead? 
Or is this an overblown partnership? Yeah, let me just add one asterisk to, the, to John's point and then come to this. The, Chris and, and I were talking about this earlier. Just to give you an illustration, I was just, I've been going back and forth to Mexico a lot in the last little while. So here we are doing all of this work on the question of Huawei investments in the uh, 5G technologies of the Five Eyes, right? We're doing all this work to get the Five Eyes to refuse to have uh, Chinese uh, Huawei technologies in 5G. We may fail, but even if we succeed, okay? Then you cross the border and you go to Mexico. Well, it's all over Mexico telecoms. Well, guess where we take in most of our sort of supply uh, and all sorts of parts of the commodity production of our telecoms from Mexico. So we can get 5G, the five eyes, to, to keep Huawei out. But if Mexico has Huawei in, then they're in, right? So these things are going to be kind of integrated development issues, infrastructure issues, technology issues, and geopolitical issues are going to become tightly integrated now in a way we haven't seen for a very long time. Uh, I'm going to use it to just emphasize one of the themes in the report. We argue, you talked about the kind of the way we're still quite divided in the West, including in, in, in infrastructure spending and development spending and support to democracy. So one of the themes is the need to get the West in the largest sense, the Japanese, the Indians, not the Indians of this, the Japanese ourselves, the Germans, others, who are investing in developing countries to join forces in much more substantial ways than we're doing so far. If you go to Mexico and you add up American investment, Japanese investment, European investment, it's larger than Chinese investment. But play it separately, and the Chinese outmaneuver us in any of these guys. Um, sorry, your question. It was on Russia China and China. Russia. Yeah, so we, we touched on it earlier. Like, I, I, I really do see a, a clear moment where for China and for Russia, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and China a little bit more slowly, realize that there is a moment of serious weakness and division in the West and begin to move very assertively to take advantage of that moment of weakness uh, in the West. And the Russians are already pushing and prodding and poking in, in whatever front they can find. And it seems to me the way I would describe it is the Chinese have kind of embraced the Russians as part of a wider strategy of, uh, of eroding the strength of the West. There are things that the Russians do that the Chinese don't want to have to do. They don't want to get their fingers dirty on some of the political stuff that the Russians have done. There are spaces where the Russians are that the Chinese don't want to be. It's extremely useful to Chinese strategy that the Russians are out there doing these things. Uh, but the bigger picture for both of them is this moment of weakness in the West that they have a fundamental stake uh, in advancing and, and them advancing into that moment. We see it in Central Asia where, I mean, these two countries should be at loggerheads. We should be sort of ruling that playing field by putting them against each other. And in fact, they're very deliberately laying down sticks between the two of them to take advantage of our weakness and our absence in some of these key files uh, and gain ground. They'll, they'll get back to fighting each other eventually. But right now, this overweening uh, priority of weakening the West, of weakening the democratic model, of weakening the role of the democracies in shaping the order is so fundamental and so powerful for them that we are watching something much tighter uh, between the two of them than we've seen before. In looking at authoritarian challenges within the West, we've been discussing Russia, we've been discussing China, we've also talked at length today about authoritarian, illiberal challenges within Western institutions. And John, given your work intimately with NATO, I want to ask you, to what extent do you see U.S. foreign policy adapting to address authoritarian challenges within NATO? What tools does NATO and the United States within NATO have at its disposal to respond to encroaching, at this point, full-blown authoritarianism within NATO member states such as Turkey? Um, that's a very difficult question, to be honest with you. I mean, that I think NATO, and I would, wouldn't speak for the leadership of NATO, but I think NATO would say that they've They've never had to seriously contemplate uh, separating a member. But one of the things you hear from NATO leadership very quickly, and we have an ambassador, former ambassador of NATO here, Victoria Nuland, uh, is that they, they tout, and I, they believe it, and I believe it, we believe it, that NATO stands for something, that NATO stands for all of the highest principles associated with what we think of as liberal democracy. So the rule of law, human rights, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all those things that, that are, I think we often simply take for, take for granted, but are in fact drifting on the wind in a number of states within NATO. Uh, and I don't know necessarily that um, our NATO leadership is in a position 
or is intent ultimately on separating an authoritarian state from the NATO alliance. But it is impossible, in my mind, for the NATO alliance to remain coherent uh, and to have the and to stand for what it does as the ultimate defensive alliance of our time uh, and have within its ranks an authoritarian state that is inherently oppressive. I, I, I can't see that those two things can exist in the same place. Now, uh, much of what NATO will do will be ultimately to take its cues from the United States, as it always has. Uh, and the United States has been a very, very powerful leader within NATO, it's, but it's also been an extraordinarily powerful partner. Um, I think both of those issues, in many respects, are in doubt now. Uh, is the United States still willing to lead in NATO? Uh, and as the United, is the United States a reliable partner in NATO? And while uh, I think if the administration were here, they would say yes and yes to both of those questions, uh, I think that if you judge, and Bruce made, it, made the point and others have made the point, we are actually doing a lot with NATO. But we're doing a lot with NATO because of folks like Mike Scaparotti, Sacure and the commander of UCOM. We're doing a lot with NATO because of Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who was a NATO commander in Afghanistan. And we're doing a lot with NATO because of Jim Mattis. Uh, all three of those people are going to shift off of here pretty quickly, and Mattis is gone entirely. Um, so to your question, the, the position that the United States or the allies should take uh, on the evolution of an authoritarian power within NATO and by the way, one or more of which, it might have very deep connections now or deepening connections with Russia. Um, we have to see how that will evolve. Because while five years ago, there had been no doubt in my mind where we would have ended up, now, given the departure of Jim Mattis, given the unwillingness of elements within this administration to condemn authoritarianism, Secretary of State had dinner the other night with uh, Viktor Orban, um, that doesn't mean he endorses it. It doesn't mean the United States endorses Hungary. But we have to stand for something within the alliance. And if that alliance looks to us for leadership on the fate of authoritarian states within this alliance of values, values in the West, then we have to lead. And if we're not going to lead, then I worry about the coherence of NATO. And this is a critical point because NATO is not immune to, nor has it uh, I mean, it's part of NATO's history to have dealt with authoritarian challenges within its ranks. There isn't a mechanism for necessarily removing member states from NATO. And yet the critical difference, as you point out, is a lack of U.S. leadership within the alliance at a critical time where we should be dealing with these challenges. Bruce, do you have a follow-up on that? Uh, yeah, and Congressman Schiff will be here in a couple of minutes, so I'll just be very brief, and then uh, I'll get off the stage, and you can, <laughs> in fact, she's saying here, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, one of the things that John and I have talked about and, and talked to the NATO leadership about is how NATO starts dealing with the digital dimension of authoritarianism and the digital dimension, the technological dimension of the response. But here, too, I want to come back to my theme that it can't just be NATO and it can't just be the transatlantic piece. We should be very interested in the fact that Japan and Australia are building up an AI alliance. That should be a, a very important thing for us, and we should be paying clear attention to it uh, and trying to build on that sort of wider, uh, wider set of initiatives. However... The congressman is here, so let me get off the stage, and we'll shift to a different part of the evening. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you very much for joining us. It's, uh, it's a great honor to have you with us. Today has been the inauguration of a, a Brookings study on uh, democracy. Uh, we know this is an extraordinarily important subject uh, for you and the rise of illiberal challenge to democracy in the world. Uh, I can tell you personally, we've met before, uh, my admiration for your leadership in the intelligence uh, community or the intelligence committee uh, your leadership on Capitol Hill, your leadership as an American uh, is unsurpassed. And uh, th at this critical moment in where we find ourselves in American history, 
uh, you are poised to exert that leadership in ways that will be essential, I think, to the future of our country, but also the future of democracy. Uh, today, I think you held hearings uh, on authoritarianism and the future of democracy, or at least that will be a part of the hearings that you'll be holding. Could we ask you to give us some of your thoughts on, on where we are uh, in your thinking on this issue and how the hearings will unfold? And then perhaps we could do a couple of questions and ask the audience. Uh, wonderful. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. My apologies uh, for being late. We uh, just took the vote on disapproving of the declaration of an emergency, and uh, the debate went on longer than anticipated. But I'm delighted to be able to, to join you. And uh, We're glad you voted. Yes, thank you. Well, and, and it's just a treat to be on the stage with you. I have such admiration for you, and thank you for your lifetime of service, a, a service that continues now in a different form. Um, we had our first open hearing uh, of the committee, and it was on the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, and I, I want to you know thank you for the report that you just put out today uh, on the rise of authoritarianism in Central Europe and in Turkey, uh, one of the recommendations I know from your report was that Congress have hearings on this, and that's exactly why we did it. We anticipated your conclusion. Uh, and uh, That's impact, I think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I wanted to make this the first open hearing because um, over the last year and a half as we have looked into Russian interference in our election, it became very uh, quickly clear that what the Russians did here um, may have been unique to us, certainly, in scope and scale, but was not unique at all uh, in terms of their interference in other parts of the world. Um, and I felt that in the day-to-day uh, -day minutia of the Russia investigation, when the headlines went, would often go from, what did Rudy Giuliani say in the morning that he contradicted in the afternoon, and what's the third version in the evening, it was easy to lose sight of the, the much bigger picture, which is there's a real attack on the very idea of liberal democracy around the world. And a lot of assumptions that, that we grew up with, that we were on this inexorable path uh, towards greater freedom of press and association and more representative government. Uh, in fact, there was nothing inevitable or inexorable about it, um, and that it was something that we were going to have to fight for. Uh, and so um, we had uh, wonderful witnesses, in, including uh, Dr. Kendall. Uh, where are you? Oh. She was. Okay. Um, we had a wonderful set of witnesses, including Secretary Albright and uh, Secretary General Rasmussen. Uh, we also had a uh, dissident from China who was tortured, and uh, and he was able to not only discuss his experiences in China, but also. Um, the degree to which China projects its influence around the world, including in our country, as he would have lectures canceled on him. Even the American Bar Association, he told us, uh, declined to publish uh, one of his works because of the um, concern that the Bar had over what it would do to their relationship in China. Uh, so that's how we kicked off uh, our uh, session, and it's something that we're going to continue to follow up on in various ways. And I have to say one thing that I found illustrative of the need for the hearing we had today, which is one of the first comments of one of my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle, was why are we having a hearing on this? Um, what does the intelligence community have to do with the rise of authoritarianism? Um, and this is an issue that obviously is not a loan of interest and concern to our committee, it's of interest and concern to other committees as well. But our intelligence agencies, I think, have a very important role to play uh, in identifying um, Russian and Chinese and other efforts to undermine democracy, but also to identify um, within other countries, some adversaries, some allies, the indicia of backsliding, um, which we, we are seeing to an increasing degree. Chairman, I know that uh, you spent a lot of time overseas talking with, uh, with our partners. You know, we just had Davos. We just had uh, Munich. Uh, we, I think it was very clear through the media coverage that Munich went less well than the administration had hoped it would go. Uh, how do you see uh, not so much our authoritarian partners, who I think in many respects are finding refuge 
in the current environment here in Washington in terms of being held accountable or being condemned. But how do you find uh, our partners viewing the state of American democracy? And are we in a moment where they may be making permanent decisions about relationships that could be irreversible? I think it was clear to, to all of our delegation, and, and one of the good news uh, stories out of Munich, frankly, was that we had probably the largest bipartisan congressional delegation to Munich uh, that went there on a mission to, um, to try to allay the concerns of our allies um, and make the point that, at least as far as Article One is concerned, our commitment to NATO and to the European Union and to Europe was ironclad. Uh, and having the delegation led by the Speaker, I think, was very important to, to hammer that home. Nonetheless, uh, we found profound concern about America's leadership, about our commitment to NATO, the transatlantic alliance, um, and what was happening to American democracy. Uh, I had an interaction, not in Munich, but uh, here uh, in Maryland uh, just the other day when a stranger came up to me and introduced himself and said that he was a physician of Chinese descent and uh, who did work for NIH and was on the faculty here, and uh, I don't mean here, but in the United States, um, and he said that what has made America powerful over the years is not your military might. It's been the power of your ideals and values uh, and the power of your alliances. And, and the country is squandering that. The administration is squandering that. And this, this was one of many times I've experienced where people that are new to the country know more about what this country is about uh, than, uh, well, than the President of the United States. Um, and... Uh, so we, we um, heard voiced extraordinary concern about where America was heading. And, uh, and I'll give you, you know, one other anecdote from Munich that I, I continue to think back on and found very striking. Um, we arrived around the same time as a tweet arrived in Europe. Um, this was a tweet that said, you better take those 800 foreign fighters back, Europe, or we're just going to cut them loose, and good luck with that. Uh, and we were meeting with uh, one of the European prime ministers who said, is this the way you treat your allies? Uh, is this the way that we are to be told of uh, your views in terms of the repatriation of foreign fighters? No diplomatic conversations, no phone call, no nothing. We just get a threat on Twitter. Uh, and of course, we returned from Munich um, to another tweet that said that the president had instructed the Secretary of State to um, make sure that this woman and child who wanted to come back from Syria would not be allowed in the country. I don't know how you, I don't know how our diplomats deal with that. Um, but uh, but I, I you know I think although this wasn't vocalized to us that there is a prayer in Europe that what we are experiencing is a bout of temporary insanity, uh, not unlike Brexit, uh, that they hope will be a one-off and that America will be back. Um, but to the point you are making, General, about is this going to result in permanent damage in terms of our alliances and allies. It will only be permanent, I think, in the sense that the rest of the world is not standing still. Uh, nations are having to decide, should we, should we uh, reimagine our relationship, not just with the United States, but with China, but with Russia? Is it time to hedge our bets? Uh, and even when this period is over, there will be lingering concern with whether this could recur, uh, whether this has been purged from the American bloodstream or whether this could come back. So that will be long term. Um, but I, I do think that one will survive this period. I think the alliance will survive this period. I think when we have a new administration, we can rapidly begin to mitigate and repair the damage. Uh, and 
in the, in the meantime, we have to do everything possible to shore up our own democracy at home uh, and also um, uh, continue to champion democracy and human rights around the world uh, through Congress if that's not going to take place through the administration. Let me just... I have to ask this. The, the debate over the uh, declaration of, a, of an emergency, could we ask for some of your insights on how that debate went within the House? Uh, the, the views of whether it's a, a genuine emergency, uh, of course, creating for the president a series of options he would not have otherwise had, as opposed to the view that this is contrived simply to get around the Congress and the power of the purse. How did that debate go? And you've just indicated that uh, the House acted, I think, as most of us would have wanted, which is to vote it down. Well, I, I haven't seen the final tally. I think that there were probably about uh, 15 or so uh, Republican members who voted in favor of the disapproval. Um, that uh, is probably a number that is not all that surprising. Um, what was more surprising, frankly, was the discussion I heard on the radio on my way here, on my interminable drive here, um, which was Mitch McConnell being asked, and you may not have heard this because you were uh, in the discussion, um, what he thinks about this now. Because, of course, he privately urged the president not to do it, um, but the, once the president did, he you know, did what we have seen all too often, which was completely capitulate. Uh, so he was asked what he thought of the lawfulness of this. And what, what followed was about 30 seconds of, of uh, stammering. Um, and the, uh, the Senate uh, leader saying, well, um, there are conflicting views about the legality of this, and I'm not a lawyer, um, and it, it's going to warrant further examination, something along those lines. Not exactly a rousing endorsement of this presidential emergency. The reality is, I don't think there's a single member, I would hope, that believes this is an actual emergency, that believes this is anything other than a, a political uh, tactic to appease a base that he promised a wall to that Mexico was never going to pay for. Um, but the courage to speak the truth to power is in very short supply. And um, some of you have, may have seen I wrote a, an open letter to my GOP colleagues uh, in the Washington Post urging members to stop sharing their private misgivings with me and with other Democratic members and to start speaking out. And even more important, to start acting out. Uh, and... I, don't, I honestly don't know why, why people want to serve in Congress if they're not prepared to do the right thing when the time comes. And I always like to joke with my constituents that a job, the job of a member of Congress is not to get reelected. It's to do the right thing and still find a way to get reelected. Uh, and I think a great many of my colleagues could do the right thing. Um, the last conversation, the last substantive conversation I had with John McCain, I marveled to him why there wasn't a single Republican in the House of Representatives who felt they had, um, they had the standing to be the John McCain of the House, the constituency to be the John McCain of the House. I would have thought that would have been a good place for any number of my GOP colleagues to be. Uh, and his response was, well, if that continues, they'll soon be calling you chairman. Um, and while I'm glad to be chairman, um, I, I wish that it was for other reasons, um, and uh, I don't know what it'll take. I, 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 I think, General, that the reality is that what it may take is um, a change in the president's standing within the party, uh, that until that happens, we're not likely to see uh, much by way of independence within the GOP. Chairman, thank you. And I Thank you for raising the name of Senator John McCain. I think all of us miss him terribly now, uh, which makes your leadership even more important right now, sir. Could you take some questions from the uh, floor? I'm happy to. We'll go for about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so uh, in the back, please, Richard. Uh, my name is Richard Bush. I work here. We're going to try to get a microphone around. Everyone has their kids on to sprint.
My name is Richard Bush. I work here at Brookings on East Asia. I'm very concerned about the way in which China is penetrating the political systems of our democratic friends in East Asia, running from Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and so on. Um, and uh, China is getting very skillful at using new technologies to warp public opinion in those countries. I wonder if there is an opportunity for the United States um, to use the resources that it has available to help those governments, first of all, understand how vulnerable they really are, uh, and then um, work with them to create defenses against uh, these penetrations. Thanks. Thank you for the question. And I think the concern is well-placed. And I think some of that is happening already. Uh, I think Cyber Command is working on some of this. Uh, I think our intelligence agencies are working with their sister agencies uh, to help um, these countries ferret out, identify uh, foreign penetration, um, uh, help them better prepare their cyber defenses. Uh, so that work is going on. It is not keeping pace, though, with what China is doing. Uh, and the future looks even um, more bleak in the sense that uh, some of these new technologies and the capacity for mischief uh, is just profound. Um, one of those, and I, this is more of a concern, frankly, with the Russians and the Chinese at this point, but um, uh, is the, the development of deep fake technology. In 2016, I was most concerned that when the Russians were dumping these stolen documents, that they would begin dumping forgeries among the real documents. Now, as best we can tell, that largely didn't happen. But what I had in mind was that they might take a real email between two real people uh, and add a third paragraph to it suggesting illegality. You can imagine how explosive that would be if that were leaked in the weeks leading up to an election. And even if you could disprove it, which would be very difficult to do because the, the rest of the email would corroborate, in a way, the false information sandwiched in between. Um, uh, being able to do that in the middle of a highly polarized election would be almost impossible. But you can imagine if this were a video uh, or an audio. I think about the, the, you know, the, the tremendous impact that that video, that poor quality video of Mitt Romney talking about the 47% had. Well, that was nothing compared to what you could do. Uh, and so this is the brave new world we're entering in terms of electoral interference. Uh, but China, uh, you know, I think among their pernicious strengths are they uh, obviously have very advanced AI. They have a, an extensive data mining operation. Uh, you know, you don't have to look much beyond the OPM hack uh, to consider what you could do with that information, particularly if you could uh, cross-index it against other databases that you have stolen or compiled, uh, looking for irregularities, looking for people who... Uh, should be on one paycheck but are on a different paycheck or whatever the case may be. Um, then you add other technologies, the, the extensive use of CCTV uh, and the export of those technologies to other countries. Uh, you look at the communications backbone they're building through Huawei and ZTE, uh, and it's a chilling uh, future. Um, so we are going to have to really step up our cyber game to defend ourselves, but we're also going to have to step up our cooperation with our allies to make sure that they protect themselves. And as we know, Chairman, one of the, the two principal objectives of deception is either to sow confusion or an absence of confidence or to create certainty. And that's exactly what has happened. Large segments of the, of the electorate have become very certain about the leadership that they want to uh, to uh, apply to, if you will, but other segments of the of the electorate have become uh, quite confused, or they have lost confidence in the electoral process, 
And in both of those cases, these have been successful, as you point out. The, one of the most chilling statistics that we, we heard from the testimony today was uh, Secretary General Rasmussen um, talked about a survey that had been done recently of the level of contentedness among people living in democratic states versus autocratic states. And there was a higher level of uh, content with autocratic governance within, than with democratic governance. Um, if that remains true, uh, the future is not uh, particularly bright uh, for democracy. But I, I think it's a, a function of just what you're saying. Um, autocratic governments can project a certain certainty, uh, give you a, a certain level of comfort that your problems are being taken care of, and a very simple way to look at things. Uh, democ democracies are messy uh, and chaotic. And, uh, and so... Um, this poses a real challenge to us uh, that we will meet, but um, we are starting behind the eight ball, I think, very slow to appreciate the problem. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Toria. You know Ambassador Newland? Yes, of Former course. Ambassador to NATO. Thanks. Chairman, thanks for being here, and I join the chorus of thanking you for your spectacular leadership on these issues, including your very clear and strong ability to explain these dangers to the American people, which is very, very important at this time. Uh, clearly in 2016, we had a major intelligence failure in the United States. So I wanted to ask you in the context of your role as chairman of the committee now, uh, two questions. The first one is whether you feel uh, that we are getting better on the intelligence side at understanding what our adversaries are capable of, what they're up to, how they are working together, and if not, what we need to do to strengthen those capabilities, but also about the pressure that some of the great men and women in our intelligence community are under now from the executive. We're now hearing that our uh, friend Dan Coates is also in trouble. Um, and what you can do from the HIPSI in your uh, oversight and leadership role to protect the integrity of the intelligence community at this time. Thanks. Um, thank you for the questions, and, and thank you for your uh, service to the country. Um, very grateful. And in terms of are we getting better, um, I think the answer is yes, and you're right. Uh, we were caught uh, very much uh, unawares in terms of the uh, Russian plans and intentions in the 2016 election. And then when, we, when they became clear, uh, as indeed they did become clear over the summer of 2016, we were, I think, far too slow to react. Uh, and uh, in the case of the, the Obama administration at the time, uh, they were deeply concerned that if they more explicitly called out the Russians on what they were doing, uh, they would be challenged with, you're just trying to influence the outcome of our election. Uh, and so they erred on the side of doing far less rather than far more. Um, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, Senator Feinstein and I at the time urged that we be much more aggressive and open. Uh, and in fact, we took the rare step, which we had never done before as the ranking members of the Intel communities, committees at the time, and have never done since, of issuing our own statement of attribution, which was based on the classified briefings we'd received, and therefore had to be signed off by the IC, uh, which they did. Um, so it was kind of a strange dynamic where the intelligence community had to scrutinize our statement of attribution to make sure that we were not saying too much, uh, but it was before the administration itself was really willing to make attribution. Um, but we have improved, although there is still far more that we need to do. And uh, I use something uh, in the midterms as my quality control, and we failed the quality control, which was um, at the Aspen conference uh, last year, uh, a representative of Microsoft uh, disclosed that there were a couple Senate campaigns that had been the targets of a spear phishing uh, effort by what looked like the same Russian actors who had been involved in the prior election. And that was the first I'd heard of it. Um, now, 
I shouldn't be learning about this from a public presentation by Microsoft at the Aspen conference. Um, but, you know, maybe that was just the Intel committee being out of the loop. Uh, and so I asked each of the Intel heads, um, were you aware of this? And I got together with the Russia task force at the NSA, which was supposed to be the body that was collecting all the information from all the various sources and developing a response plan and whatnot. Were they aware of it? And, and the answer was basically no. Um, and whether this was an issue, uh, I would come to find out it wasn't, because I went to Microsoft. Was this an issue of Microsoft not informing the FBI or DHS? Was this an issue of informing the local FBI or DHS, but it not communicated to uh, the headquarters or whatnot? It wasn't any of those problems. Um, it was disclosed and disclosed at a high level, but it was still not communicated within the IC. Uh, and so, um, you know, one of the early telltale signs that the Russians were back at it did not make it into the task force, did not make it into, uh, you know, the, the body that was charged with assimilating all this information, acting on it in real time. Um, there were other, other indications also that we were not at, 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 uh, anywhere near where we should be. Part of that is that in a normal administration, you would expect that the president, apart from a photo opportunity, would sit down with his or her cabinet and go around the table and ask the Secretary of Defense, uh, what are we doing to uh, establish a deterrent uh, for further meddling? How prepared are we? Um, what do we anticipate and what would be a proportionate response if the Russians do this, if the Russians do that? Secretary of State, uh, have you made it abundantly clear to your counterpart uh, that this won't be tolerated, that if the Russians don't like the sanctions they have now, they, they're, uh, they, they're going to be dealing with a much more director of the CIA. What can you tell us about plans and intentions, DHS? Are you getting the cooperation of the state secretaries? Uh, are they taking advantage of the diagnostics we have to offer? Uh, who around the table can call you know, this governor or that secretary of state uh, to make sure that they get on the stick? None of that was happening, of course, because the president viewed that as a, a threat to his legitimacy. Um, but I think that the agencies took that on of their own. Um, but, you know, while that, that is certainly better than nothing, far better than nothing, it's still not the same as if the directive is coming from the top uh, and there's a, a real sense of urgency communicated at the top. Um, in terms of the IC, morale, recruiting, um, I think the morale is, is still fine. Um, uh, I did a town hall at the CIA last year, which was totally fascinating for me. I don't know if it was fascinating for them, but it was fascinating for me to hear what questions they had. Um, the most intriguing question I got was, what keeps me up at night? And I thought... <laughs> Your question's going to keep me up at night. You're, you're the one who's supposed to be staying up at night. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, th they're consummately professional. Um, and they're keeping their focus on the task. Um, and I would imagine with Dan Coates, who I have great respect for, and Gina Haspel as well, um, and the other leaders of the IC who are, are really uh, superb, that... There are times, uh, and this is complete speculation, this is nothing anyone has confided in me, there are times when they probably have thought, should I stay or should I go? Um, like Secretary Mattis, you know, at this point, um, do I make more of an impact by staying or do I make more of an impact by going? Um, and I have to think that within the agencies, uh, within, you know, the the... Uh, office of the Director of National Intelligence, people are urging them to stay because they don't know what will come after. Uh, and I have to think that, that those individuals feel a real sense of responsibility to the men and women who work within the IC. Um, and I've been proud that they have been willing to speak truth to power. Um, and, uh, and 
part of what we do in our committee is make sure that that doesn't change. Um, when the administration represents something at odds with what we are informed by our intelligence community, we, we push back. Um, if we see a pressure being applied uh, to the intelligence community and any sign of wavering, we push back. Um, I raise concerns with the IC when I see the Secretary of DHS cite non-existent intelligence about the terrorist threat at our southern border. Um, when Mike Pompeo was the director of the CIA and said, I think, uh, repeatedly that the intelligence community had found that the Russian interference in 2016 had no effect on the election outcome, that was flatly untrue. Uh, and we pushed back. Um, and, and it's, I think, a vital part of our responsibility to, to police and protect uh, the IC to make sure that they continue to um, have the the independence they need and the resources they need, uh, and and that we have their back. Chairman, we have time for one question finally, and I'm going to ask it if I may. Um, you've you said twice already the that there is nearly a moral obligation to speak truth to power. We have an international fellow here at Brookings who watched the process of the 2016 election, the campaign and the election and since unfold. Uh, and the observation of that fellow was that great violence has been done to the civility of the American political conversation. And in the end, while policy might be retrieved or might be corrected, that may be one of the longest standing uh, aspects of damage that has been done as a result of all of this. I, I think I can speak for the entire group here tonight that you have embodied a civility and a restraint that's admirable. How do you see the civility in the Congress? How do you see the civility between the Congress and the administration? But more importantly and more broadly, how do you see the civility going forward in the American political conversation? Well, I, I remember... Um early in the administration, uh, thinking that those that served within, in the administration had to wrestle with a conundrum. How do you ethically serve a deeply unethical person? Uh, and there is no good answer to that. There is no um, bright line about how to do that. And some have succeeded, uh, many have failed. Um, but I, I was also very uh, mindful of the fact that we were seeing in real time something we always knew to be the case but never had such a clear proof, and that is just how much character mount, uh, matters in the Oval Office. Uh, and, I, I, and over time, you could see the lack of character in the Oval Office infect the whole of government. Uh, and um, you don't even need to look at all the people who've been indicted and gone to jail or about to go to jail, um, but uh, the attacks on the very idea of truth, for example, um, that, uh, that we have seen from not just Rudy Giuliani, but from um, Kellyanne Conway and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, to me there's nothing more corrosive to a democracy than the idea that there is no truth that we are all entitled to our own set of facts. Uh, and one even broader realization uh, for me was watching the rally that the president did after Dr. Ford testified, uh, when he mocked her. Uh, and it was greeted by laughter and applause. Uh, and I thought to myself, it's no longer just the whole of government that has been infected by the lack of character in the Oval Office, but it's the the people as well. Um, today you probably saw, or maybe it happened while you were here and haven't seen yet, one of my colleagues in the House, um, uh, and I don't know how to characterize this uh, and remain civil, but um, tweeting uh, at Michael Cohen, um, basically threatening to expose extramarital affairs um, when he comes and testifies. Um, and 
I think that kind of conduct would be unthinkable three years ago or five years ago, but it is not only very thinkable, but acted upon now. Um, and that's, that's no accident. Uh, and and it, it's, a, it's a challenge, um, I think, to talk about these issues in a way that people will hear you. Um, I, uh, I occasionally get pushback from fellow Democrats um, that I need to uh, fight fire with fire, uh, that I need to uh, get down in the, uh, in the mud and, uh, um, uh, and wrestle with our adversaries. And, uh, and I, I don't think that's the answer at all. Um, you know, I think when your opponent gets down in the mud, you leave them there. And uh, in my experience, the people who need to hear you, uh, if you don't talk in civil and rational terms, will never hear you. Uh, and unless you just want to talk to yourself or talk to a chorus, uh, if there's any hope that we're going to break through, uh, then we have to find a, a way to connect with each other. And I'll just conclude with one rare moment of breakthrough I had, uh, and it was at an airport. I get a lot of my feedback at airports these days. And I had someone come up to me, uh, I think in one of the Carolinas, and say, uh, Congressman Schiff, right? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, you can level with me. This collusion stuff, it's not real, right? It's not real. And uh, I said to him, uh, let me ask you a question. What would you say if I told you that during the presidential campaign, someone approached Chelsea Clinton um, offering dirt on Donald Trump as part of what was described as the Russian government's effort to help the Clinton campaign? And her reaction was, I would love to have the help. And they had a secret meeting with a Russian delegation in the Brooklyn headquarters of the Clinton campaign. Um, and then they lied about it. First they said they had no such meeting, and then when they were forced to acknowledge there was such a meeting, which was attended by the campaign chairman, John Podesta, and others, then they said it was about adoptions, but that was a lie. It wasn't about adoptions at all. It was about relief from Russian sanctions. Would you call that collusion? And he said, well... I think I, I see where you're going with this. And, uh, and I said, well, what would you say if I told you that National Security Advisor Susan Rice was having secret conversations with the Russian ambassador to undermine sanctions imposed on the Russians for interference in our elections? Would you consider that collusion with the Russians? It's like, I really think I can see where you're going with this. And uh, you know something? I probably would. Um, that was a rare breakthrough. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, one of the most cross-cutting challenges of all, and I have no answer for this, is we now get our information from such different places. Um, and we are in a stovepipe world where it is increasingly difficult to talk to each other. Uh, and that may be the most cross-cutting of, of all the challenges. It's as if we have global economic disruption on an order of magnitude like the Industrial Revolution, simultaneous with a revolution in communication, um, not unlike the invention of the printing press, both going on at the same time. Um, and that is posing an enormous stress on democracy. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for all the work that you're doing on this issue and really been, a, been uh, honored to be a part of the discussion. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I know I can speak for the entire audience tonight in, in thanking you for the extraordinary example you set for us every day through your leadership, your civility, and your commitment to the democracy of the United States of America. Thank you for that leadership, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.